And greetings, welcome to The Dividing Line. We've got a lot to get to today, so thanks for joining us. I've got a bunch of stuff piled up over here to get to, and uh, we had just so much positive uh, feedback from the last program uh, that uh, we're going to do something similar again, uh, this time on the subject of Mormonism. So hopefully you will find it to be useful and helpful, and uh, uh, saw folks that had utilized the information that we shared on the last program that same day in witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, that's exciting, that's great, and hopefully that means if you watch this program, the Mormon missionaries will be coming by your home <laughs> for dinner. Um, and <laughs> invite them in. Uh, uh, we did that years and years ago with Elders Reed and Reese. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, I made Elders Reed and Reese um, uh, my, I wasn't really good at it yet, but they were tasty. Um, beef, uh, de deep fried burritos, sort of a chimichanga type thing, sort of. I was 19. Yeah, I was probably 19. Uh, so, man, I'm sitting here thinking back how, <laughs> how long ago that was. I wonder where elders Reed and Reese are. I really, I would really, I wonder if there's, if there's a way that maybe Mormons can, um, if you're a former Mormon missionary and you've come to know the Lord, especially through this ministry, get in touch with us and let us know, is there, a, is there like a directory of missionaries who served at certain years in certain missions? Um, I think it was called the Arizona... Phoenix Mission back then, or, or maybe Arizona Phoenix Mesa. I, I don't remember, um, but it would have been 1982. Elders Reed and Reese. Uh, I would love to find out where they are. I would love to have some way of contacting them um, because they were the first two missionaries that uh, I met with. It's all their fault. Uh, but yep, yep. If you. I wasn't going to say that, Rich. <laughs> Rich said it's all their fault, and that will, that will make sure they will never get in contact with me. I can assure you that. Um, but in a sense, it is. <laughs> they, um, look, they knocked on my in-law's door, and my sister-in-law answered the door. Now, my wife's an identical twin, and... Um, Th those twins were really cute, and they are really cute, still are really cute to this day. I did, I did all the aging. She does, she's hardly changed at all. And um, after 40 years of marriage with me, that's pretty amazing. But um, I think that's why they wanted to come back. <laughs> they wanted to come back. There was some missionary stuff going on there, missionary dating thing going on there. And uh, so uh, we met on a Monday and on a Thursday for about three hours each time. And uh, that's literally, uh, as far as real, you know, to set a date, that's really what started us on the path to the founding of Alpha and Omega Ministries, uh, which took place uh, a year and uh, just, just over a year later. Yeah, just over a year later. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was an, I worked a lot faster back then. That I do now. I'm not nearly as, as fast as I used to be, I guess. Anyway, uh, before we get to all that on, uh, on Mormonism, uh, I, I, did, I, I, need, I felt I needed to, in light of everything that's happening around us, the speed at which it's happening, I, I wanted to um, make some comments. Uh, day four yesterday, I guess it was, or was it yesterday? When, when was the, the flight shut down? Was that yesterday or David? That was yesterday. Okay. Uh, I, I don't need to even comment, hopefully, on the reality that um, the people that God has placed in leadership over this nation are um, evil and so evil that they are incompetent uh, at doing what they're supposed to be doing, if they even try to do what they're doing. Um, we have a man in charge of the transportation in this country who pretends to be married to another man, 
who was recently on maternity leave because they adopted uh, twins, as I recall. There are numerous pictures of him cuddling with uh, this other individual uh, out there. So we should not be at all surprised if we have even a, a semblance of a concept of biblical morality at what's happening around us. But the, a, a lot of people still haven't caught on. There are a lot of people talking about this now. There are a lot of, of, of people from many perspectives that know enough about the left and its history and its worldview that they are, they're telling people. You, you don't have to learn it from Christian ministers. We were sort of slow getting to the punch anyways. We shouldn't have been. Um, so there's a lot of people talking about it now. But there's still, for many, many people, including Christians, a hesitance to put the puzzle together, uh, see how the pieces relate, because they seem to be disjointed. Um, this morning, Dr. Moeller uh, was talking on the briefing about an article uh, discussing, from, from an educational organization, discussing the morality of, in essence, cutting parents out from how you treat a young student in regards to their sexuality. And this was in regards to a four-year-old. We're talking pre-school. And the perspective was a, a preschool teacher, simply the moral thing for the preschool teacher to do is to keep the parents in the dark and to assist this child with their gender identity. Now, Maybe it's my age, um, but only a few years ago, the entire world would have thought that was the most insane thing that anyone had ever suggested. Evil, absurd. Um, but now it is the settled consensus of the academic elites that while a four-year-old cannot make almost any decisions about their diet, their bedtime, their clothing, their dental care, what crayons they use, anything, that somehow um, they can make decisions concerning their gender identity. It is, I have no respect. I cannot work up respect for any adult that is that stupid. That absolutely asinine to hold such a perspective. I, I can't. I, I just can't. It, it's, it is absurdity. It's insanity on a level that, that, is, that is absolutely beyond evil. And so you, you hear these people and you realize this is what the NEA is about. This is what all these people are about. This is... Christian parents, everything has changed. And you simply have to recognize, yes, God wants you to have children. God wants you to have families. God wants you to have godly families. But you simply cannot turn your children over to these insane, evil people. Oh, there are still good Christian teachers out there. Maybe so, but I don't know how they're surviving. And most of them will tell you they don't know how they're surviving in this petri dish of satanic stupidity that is the public indoctrination system. Don't call it an educational system. They're not educating anybody. They're indoctrinating them. That's all there is to it. So we look at this insanity, this evil insanity happening around us. And what people don't seem to understand is that there is a direct connection between that article and that discussion taking place about children and gender identity and all the rest of that stuff. And the all of a sudden, out of the blue, 
need to ban gas stoves. Yeah. Yeah. See, we, we sit around going, there's so much stuff coming at me. I, I can't. What? What? Th this is insanity. What's going on? And it seems like it's so much disconnected stuff. It's not. The difficulties in travel, the gender identity with children, and now one of the safest, um, most efficient means of cooking food. This insane, evil, out of control regime is saying we need to get rid of most of the estimates I've seen, 65 to 70 percent of all restaurants. That's what they cook with, is gas. And of course, we've already, <laughs> we already saw the meme, I'm not sure if you saw the meme, of Pelosi, Kamala Harris, AOC, uh, Jill Biden, I think it was those four. And they're all in their kitchens showing food they've just cooked, and every single one of them has one of those hyper expensive, super duper gas ranges. Because everybody knows. Um, you know, I don't have a gas range. I, I do have gas at my house, so I, I suppose I could have a gas range. Um, and I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> I really am. I really am thinking about it now. It's like, hmm, maybe, that, maybe that's the direction we need to go. But, uh, you know, the hypocrisy, the impossibility of all this. And people are literally sitting back. Now we have a single study, a single study funded by the World Economic Forum. I'm sorry. Anything associated with the World Economic Forum is a piece of communist Garbage. That's just all there is to it. They've proven what they're all about. If you, if you haven't figured that out yet, you're so far behind the curve, we can't really help you. World Economic Forum is the uh, enslavement movement of the modern day. They are seeking to enslave all of us. And every single one of these things is a part of this movement. Why get rid of gas stoves? One study that just all of a sudden popped out of nowhere when we've been using this method, method for, clean, for, for cooking and heating and, and everything else for, for years and 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 years, now it's racist. I don't know if you caught that. It, I don't know if you caught Everything's racist. <laughs> I mean, by now, aren't we numb to the term racist? It's been so completely emptied of any meaning that has any rational connection with what goes on in normal human minds, that the very fact that someone uses it, just, just, you just automatically realize, okay, you obviously don't have any meaningful argument, so you're going to pull the racist card. Okay, there you go. But now it's considered racist, because allegedly uh, black children have more asthma um, than white children do, and therefore it's due to gas stove. Why? How is this all connected? Well, it's simple. Um, well, it's not simple, but it needs to be understood. Uh, why, why the electric vehicle thing? Because we all know the grid cannot charge those, those vehicles. We cannot create the number of batteries and sustain the number of batteries that would be necessary um, for everybody to have an electric vehicle. It is not possible. And we all know that there are little black children digging in the dirt in the center of Africa right now to give us our battery, okay? That's a reality. That, that, that's what's in here, okay? Every one of us, every one of us, we, we've all got them. And so these people who are now talking about getting rid of gas ranges because of someone with asthma, they don't care that those children will probably not live past 40 because of all the stuff they've exposed to. They don't care that's over there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the absolute raping of the land to mine all the stuff that is allegedly needed, to mine all the stuff that's needed for all the wind turbines. and everything. They don't care what that does to the world. They don't care that it takes a massive amount of specialized materials to make one EV over it. 
over again. It's like six times what it takes to make a regular car. And it won't last nearly as long. The economic disaster, the economic, I'm sorry, the environmental disaster that these things are is astonishing. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Because it has nothing to do with any of that. It has nothing to do with climate. The biggest lie that's ever been told in the history of man, and more and more evidence shows it all the time. Every single day, there is evidence everywhere of the stupidity of this entire climate stuff. You know, oh, it's raining in California. Did you know that it rained in the Sacramento Valley in Northern California from December of 1861 to the end of January? of 1862. The valley became a lake. People died, livestock floating around. It was the greatest flood ever cataloged. That was 1862. There was no fossil fuel use to, to, to speak of. Mankind had nothing to do with it. But if it rains today, Ellen DeGeneres is out next to a stream that's flowing hard, and this is due to your SUV or now your gas stove. It's idiocy, it's absurdity, and they, now I'm sure Ellen DeGeneres really does believe this stuff. That's the, that's the scary part, is these people really do believe this stuff. But the people at the top know it's absurd, and that's why they're not getting rid of their gas stove. And they're not, they're not getting rid of their, 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 uh, Batteries and everything else. They don't care. This is all about their power and comfort anyway. So how's it all connected? If you have the ability to travel, then you have the ability to associate with others. You have freedoms and liberties to choose where you're going to go without gaining the permission of your new rulers, your new owners, your masters at the WEF, the WHO, et cetera, et cetera. If you have, you see, as long, you know, there's electricity going through all the lights in the studio here. And we all know that the ability now exists for the utility companies to just simply type something in on a computer and these lights go out. Electricity is easy. To control. And so if you control the electricity and people can only use electricity to charge up their EV, which they're not really going to have enough of them anyways, or everything else they do, they control you. They control what you can do, when you can do it, how much of it you can do. You can't do that with natural gas. You can't do that with propane. You can try to make it harder to get, but there's already lots of, you know, every time I go to an RV park, I can tell who the long-term people are because they've got these massive propane tanks sitting outside their RV. They're huge. And those things can last for a long, long, long time. And you can't turn them off remotely. You have to be sending your people out to do that kind of stuff. They, don't want, to, they want to be able to do it electronically, fast, quickly. All of this is to destroy utterly the family, destroy any kind of moral fabric to this nation, and make everyone utterly dependent upon them. They determine when you can travel. They determine how what temperature you keep your house at, if you even have a house, because that's going to, you know, eventually, we all know how this works in China. That's what they want. They want the, the Chinese credit system, cultural credit system, the societal credit system, where everything is designed to make you subservient to the regime, to make you think like them. And anyone who resists, your standard of living crashes immediately. You have to sacrifice. And see, they've understood, they've come to understand what the Muslims came to understand a long, long time ago. See, North Africa was a Christian place before Islam swept through. 
And people think that the, the Muslims came along and put the sword to everybody's throat and said, convert or die. They didn't do that. Oh, in some instances, but vast majority. They knew that that, was, that would not work. What they did, and what they do to this day, is they vastly limit the opportunities to even make a living for anybody who isn't a Muslim. Limited what you could do, limited your education, limited your financial uh, possibilities. And they realized and came to understand that over time, that wears people down and gets people to do what you, their leaders, want them to do. And so what we're seeing with all of this is the enslavement globally of the world. But starting with the West, because that's where most of the capital is. And it is all connected together. Can't travel unless we allow you to. And we'll only let the people travel who build up their social credit score. In other words, by praising the government, doing what the government says, not going to church, um, uh, not homeschooling your children. Believe you me, I know there has been a huge increase in homeschooling. Thank God for that. You must understand. You can't do that in Germany. You can't do that in Germany. And if you don't, if you don't recognize that these powerful educational unions and these people, the same Democrats who yesterday stood on the House floor and voted as a block with, I think, two exceptions, against a bill. Again, it won't pass. Senate won't pass it. But a bill that would require doctors to render medical assistance to babies that survive abortion. They stood there. Nadler stands there, looking into the camera, spewing evil on the level of Himmler, and the entire Nazi party. Those people will not allow you to educate your children in the future. It's coming, I'm telling you, you just watch. It's coming. They have to have complete and total control. That is the essence of their worldview. Because once you get rid of God, the state becomes God. And these are religious fanatics. And they see anyone who questions their authority as total heretic. And so the most zealous inquisitor of past centuries, who was using torture to try to cleanse the souls of the heretic, believe you me, that attitude has not departed earth. And once it's associated with secularism, oh, goodness. Um, I'll just mention one more thing and we'll shift topics. But um, I didn't bring it up. Well, you know what? Uh, it, it, it should pop up fairly quickly. There was a, um, I started noting, because, you know, 2019, I spent a long time over in London, so I've got connections over there. And I started seeing um, clips from um, the House of Commons, House of Lords, I, 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 Parliament, just ripping and snorting on somebody who, who just said something really, really bad. And so I did a little Googling around or in my case, um, duck, duck, going around. <laughs> um, and it was conservative member of parliament, Andrew Bridgen. He's been stripped of the party whip uh, for saying the following things. Um, first of all, he tweeted a link to an article questioning the safety of the vaccines. Oh, no! You'd read an article questioning the safety of the vaccines? I mean, just because you're seeing people falling down dead all over the place regularly? 
over and 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 over again? You would dare read an article that would question the central sacrament of the World Economic Forum mechanism of taking over the world? How, how dare you? And then he added this. Here it is. So much for YouTube for us. As one consultant cardiologist said to me, this is the biggest crime against humanity since the Holocaust. So he quoted somebody else. No one questions as to whether this consulting cardiologist said it or not. Nobody questions as to whether it's true or not. None of that matters. That doesn't matter. The fact that a world movement took experimental genetic material and crammed it into the veins of billions of people without anywhere near the necessary safety analysis and testing. And we're only now getting the data from Pfizer and the others that shows they knew what this was going to do. They knew what the problems were. And all you got to do is, is just quote a cardiologist who says this is the biggest crime against humanity since the Holocaust, and you are out. You are out. That's where we are. That's, that's what we're facing. That's the situation today. I don't make the stuff up. I just sit here and go, I can't believe it, just the way you do too. <sighs> okay, brr, shake that one off. <laughs> let's, uh, let's switch gears. Let's shift gears. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Mormonism. Like I said, you know, I think the last time that we did an extended series on the subject of Mormonism was when Mitt Romney was running for president of the United States. And that would have been 2012. Wasn't it 2012? 10 years ago. And once again, as I said on the program uh, two days ago, this is where we started. Um, this is what, you know, when Alpha Omega Ministries was founded, our focus was on Mormonism and Mormonism alone. The Jehovah's Witness stuff was just, I think when we, when we filed the incorporation papers and stuff, I think I had started collecting Jehovah's Witness books. Okay, so maybe it wasn't alone, but it was our primary focus, and for years. Um, you know what we need to do for our 40th anniversary? We need to get, we need to find somebody, and this time, Instead of just silk screening, we need to go all the way with embroidery. We need some satin baseball jackets. <laughs> I don't know, but man, I'd, I'd, I'd get one. Um, man, I'm going to tell you, I was, I was just sitting here thinking. I've got Josh working on a logo with a 40. Really? Okay. Well, I was just thinking about that first general conference. You see, folks, you need to understand. Uh, I, Mike Bellavo, Mike and Linda Bellavo, Kelly and I, we were the four original founders, people. Um, and in, I think, May of 1984, it's in one of my old um, uh, copies of the LDS Scripture. Uh, I wrote in it because I bought it at the LDS bookstore, which, man, it's, I visited that LDS bookstore again last time I was up there. It is so sad. It's a trinket shop. It's a, remember how big that thing used to be? I mean, the books and the, 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 the LDS scripture section was huge. Well, it, it, my favorite place was going down in the basement. Yeah. The yeah. Oh, it, it, oh, it is. It, the, I think that's where I got my books. It's amazing how it has changed um, in, in it's amazing how Mormonism has changed in all these years. It really, really has. Anyway, we, we went up to uh, Salt Lake City 
in my 1964 Dodge Dart. And we were passing out tracks outside the temple. And I forget exactly how it worked out that we, that's when we found out about what the general conference was. And so I, it wasn't the next one, but, but it, one of the earlier conferences, I forget who the guy was that did the witnessing with the word t-shirt and stuff like that. Remember that guy? He was at North Phoenix yeah. that did silk screening stuff. This was back before you could do all this stuff on the internet because there was no internet yet. Yeah. And he came up with these satin baseball jackets. And they were nice. There was a, most of them, I think, the first run were gold. But then eventually we could get purple and the girls could get pink. And, and there, was a, there was a wide variety. Yeah, but we had blue. And you'd had the Alpha and Omega logo on it. And we went up there once. And we had about 20 people. So we're driving up there, okay? It's not a short drive, especially if we do it at one shot. Yeah, we... Yeah, well, we, we did that a few times and then we got smart because it was dangerous. People trying to fall asleep and stuff like that. So we would go up the night before and we'd stay at, you know, always at the top end of stuff at Motel 6. <laughs> Eat at Taco Time, which people then renamed Taco Time Bomb. Um, but I just remember that first Saturday when we all had our satin baseball jackets. And as a group, I led that group across North Temple. And the Mormons knew we were there. They knew we were there uh, because we took up our posts at the, at the North Gate, the South Gate, and the West Gate. And we were, we were identifiable now. Um, and there were a bunch of us. And man, security knew all about us. What was his name? John? What was that guy's name? John, yeah. They, ooh, yeah, he was an interesting one. Steve. Yeah, yeah, Steve was. Steve, Steve was a guy like. Steve liked us. Steve was cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just wonder where you know most of those guys were much older than us. They're probably not even around anymore. Um, but uh, we we did that for years and years and years. Eventually, we started flying. Um, but uh, toward the end, and then the King James only guys showed up and destroyed all of it. So. Um, but I've personally had over five, I, I figured it out once, over 5,000 conversations with LDS missionaries over the years. And as I said on the last program, Mormonism is a significantly broader subject than Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, you need to know your stuff in depth. Mormonism. Oh, sure, there are some real sharp Mormons out there. Any of you who've watched my uh, conversations with Alma Allred will know that there are Mormons that read Christian theology and, and can engage in that type of thing. But let's be honest, they're rare. They're extremely rare. Um, and the Mormonism that we are dealing with today is not the Mormonism that we were dealing with when we first started talking to Mormons back in the 1980s. Believe you me. And I'm going to tell you something. It was easier back then. It was easier because they actually believed something identifiable. When you talk to one Mormon, um, could you find some differences with the next Mormon you talk to? Yeah, but in general, you had a, a consistent testimony, a, a consistent set of theology. You just don't have that anymore. Has there always been a subjective element in Mormonism? Oh, yeah. yeah that, you know, I, early on, once I had really come to be well-armed as far as Mormonism is concerned, I'd read not just the Christian books, but LDS books, and had memorized lots of stuff, and um, could really... Uh, show a Mormon missionary a lot of stuff. Even early on, you'd have the missionaries who would go, well, you know, after you've, you've stumped them, they've got nothing to say. You've just strengthened my testimony in Joseph Smith. <laughs> you'd hear that over and over again because there's this subjective testimony thing that you don't get from Jehovah's Witnesses. That's just not a witness mindset at all. 
And so there always was a level of subjectivism there. And man, I'm telling you, that has proven to be the poison pill for the, the Mormon church today. Um, because the, the changes that have taken place, the change in emphasis, the change in the missionary. Oh my. Uh, I, I remember, <laughs> look, we, I could sit here literally all day and tell you story after story after story uh, across the years. But I remember, wasn't it at your place? Do you remember meeting with two missionaries and the one guy was sitting on the edge of the, of the couch? Because I think Paige was there, so I, I think it was at your place. Um, one missionary, he's just, he's engaged and he's rah-rah and he's, he's fighting back. And if I recall correctly, <laughs> the other missionary was at the other end of the couch and he fell asleep. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, he was, he was, he, he did, he could care less what was going on. I think he literally, uh, went to sleep. So you could find all sorts of missionaries. But now when you encounter missionaries, to encounter something like the guy who was really engaged, he's the wild rarity now. You've just got this subjective, well, we're all Christians, and we just think that what we've got is really neat type of a situation, which you just did not have back then. Those missionaries, they didn't call themselves Christians. Not the first ones I met with. They were Latter-day Saints, and they'd still tell you the story that Joseph Smith was told, you know, there are only two churches, the Church of the Lamb and the Church of the Devil, and, and you're not to join the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and the Methodists. They're all corrupt. Their creeds are an abomination in my sight. But they, they believe that. And you know what? It's a whole lot easier to talk to a Mormon who actually believes that than the squishy, jello, throw it up on the wall, it just slides down and leaves a bad mark on the wall type theology that you have amongst most Mormons today. And that's why they're numbers. Man, back in those days, I remember when I first started teaching in class on Mormonism at North Phoenix Baptist Church, in an average week, in an average week, 273 Southern Baptists became Mormon. And at that time, the average Southern Baptist Church had 274 members. So one church wholesale per week, 52 per year, were converting to Mormonism at that time. That is not the case anymore. That is not the case anymore. Now, there's a lot of reasons for it. I could tell you what a lot of the reasons were. Gordon Hinckley. Gordon Hinckley is one of the main reasons. Um, but there was a decision made back in the late 80s, early 90s, that Mormonism was going to mainstream. It was going to try to look more Christian, was going to send graduates from, that had masters from BYU out to other institutions to get PhDs in Ivy League schools to, to raise their, yeah, to raise their, what they looked like uh, to people. What they didn't realize is those people were going to come back and inject a level of skepticism into the leadership of the LDS Church, they will never, ever recover from. They'll never recover from. Uh, there are so many BYU graduates go out, come back, leave Mormonism. Because when you apply modern skeptical methodology to the history of Mormonism, Joseph Smith cannot survive it. He cannot survive it. It's not possible. So. How then do you deal with the Mormon missionary? Well, um, again, since there is such a wide variety of things, I'm not going to get nearly as in-depth here as we did the last program with Jehovah's Witnesses, because there are so many different topics. And in, in, in the situation we face today, the, the challenge you have is you have to find out, is this a believing Mormon that actually knows what they believe? I remember 
I remember when we'd go out to Mesa, those first few years, well, the first 10 years, you'd encounter young people, that non-missionaries, so you're, you know, 13, 14-year-old guys. And they knew what they believed. And they already had some of their arguments down. I remember kids would come up to me if I had a cross on or something like that. Would you wear a dagger around your neck if uh, Jesus was stabbed to death? You know, type. I mean, and they knew what they believed. And, and you could talk to them about what they believed. And sometimes parents would come up and weren't happy that you were doing that. Uh, but hey, you shouldn't have let the kid run off uh, during, the, during the Easter pageant anyways, right? He was bored. He had seen this thing since he was a kid anyhow. Um, today, to run into a Mormon as an adult, that has read anything, anything like Marvelous Work in a Wonder, The Grand Richard, Articles of Faith, James Talmud, Mormon Doctrine, Bruce R. McConkie, it's almost like, it's almost like any modern Mormon missionary hisses at you if you even mention the name Bruce R. McConkie. Oh, oh, oh. Allegedly an apostle of Jesus Christ. Fallen out of favor really quickly upon his death. Really. He was sort of the last hardliner, and it was not but months after he died that I had missionaries going, well, you know, that was just Bruce R. McConkie. And it's like, wow. Um, anyway, so one of the, 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 one of the biggest issues is, are you talking to a, a Mormon who actually believes and knows what they believe? And how much do they know? Is this a temple Mormon? Is this a Mormon who's received their endowments in the LDS temple? Have they been baptized for the dead? Is this a priesthood holder? Now, if it's a priesthood holder, you can expect at least some level of understanding, even though I, I've talked to many a, a missionary who is an elder who has to have received their temple endowment that clearly did not get a whole lot out of what they experienced. Either they don't know the background of it. Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I may be talking to a lot of folks who are going temple endowment, priesthood. What are you talking about? Again, Mormonism is a broad subject. And uh, when you see those temples, not the steakhouses, but the when it says temple, um, when you see those buildings um, in various places, and the 1990s, I remember when Hinkle, I remember I was in the food court up at Crossroads Plaza, which isn't there anymore. I was in the food court, uh, probably having a crisp meat burrito, I would assume, um, watching the conference on TV during one of the breaks. And it was, I remember Hinkley making the announcement that there was going to be a big push to build a lot more temples. Now, they weren't nearly as big and ornate as the old ones were, but they, and they did it. Um, you know, we've got a, we've got a temple out on uh, Pinnacle Peak Road uh, in North Phoenix. Yeah, and it's, honestly, it's, it's maybe twice the size of a, of a steak center. You know, it, it's, it's a mini temple. It really, really is. I, I toured that one before, yeah. Um, that was part of this push that Hinckley uh, announced at that time. And the, the endowments that you go through there, uh, I remember the first time I ever heard them. Because someone had gone through with these mini, I know you're less than 40 or so, you don't remember these, but these mini micro cassette tape recorders. Didn't have digital yet micro cassette tape recorders, and they had, they had taped it to their leg. They had been converted, had come to realize that Mormonism was not true. And so they wanted a, a record of what they had been taught in the temple. And I remember the first time I actually listened to the entire endowment ceremony, which is much shorter now. It's, it's been edited down a great deal since then. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, certainly. Since, since, since back in the days of Brigham Young and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, all been shortened a great deal. Um, but now we have video. Now we have videos of portions of this. I've got a video here somewhere. I didn't queue it up. 
of um, you know the baptismal font built on the sta- back of the statues of twelve oxen and and uh, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, so if you're talking to a Mormon who is a temple um, graduate <laughs> has received their endowments in the temple, then hopefully there at least be some understanding. If they're not, they honestly may not have a clue. And I've now run into Mormons, former missionaries, uh, people who used to have leadership positions in their, their wards, and they've now adopted a, 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 a liberal, Joseph Smith might have meant this, he might have meant that, but you know, Joseph Smith made mistakes, and all prophets make mistakes, and uh, you know, when I, when I look at the, the two uh, LDS guys, that um, our two guys at Apologia did the debate with uh, last year, Man, that is not how any Mormon ever talked to us in the 1980s or 1990s. Oh, those 13-year-old boys knew more about Mormonism oh, oh yeah. than these guys. Oh, yeah, big time, big time. Well, and, we're, and had a more focused idea that there is truth and there is error. So that's one of the biggest issues you have to deal with, is find out who you're talking to. And then what are you going to talk about? Um, we used to do training seminars prior to going up to Salt Lake City, going out to Mesa. We do uh, role-playing and things like that. And you'd always have people that wanted to you know, argue about polygamy and stuff like that. And we would say, look, it's not that those things are not important, um, but you only have a certain amount of time. And what do you need to communicate to the Mormon? You need to communicate who God is, who Christ is, and what salvation is. Three things. Who God is, who Christ is, what salvation is. Now, did we pass out tracts that had some that, that addressed other issues? Yes. Um, but they we all we would always make sure that everyone was trained on how to then take the subject of that tract and take it straight into those important things. In fact, I grabbed some of our old tracts. And, um, uh, you know, I'm really bummed that we didn't get to go up to General Conference. Uh, COVID shut down General Conference in the spring of uh, 2020 because case against the First Vision, we were ready to talk to the Mormons about the fact that their own material demonstrates the first vision never took place. That the whole thing about the spring of 1820 was made up years and years later. And that there's a ton of evidence within their own writings, within secular records about where the Smiths lived, the whole nine yards. You know, we passed this one out for years and years and years. It's still a really good track. Um, uh, It's got photocopies of relevant documents and, and all sorts of stuff in it. But the first vision, the foundation of Mormon polygamy. Polygamy, uh, polytheism. Uh, that allows you to go straight into who is God, and the biblical texts that, that that teach that. Jesus is sufficient. This was one of the first tracts that my dad published, or my dad printed for us uh, at North Phoenix Baptist Church. Wow, in Phoenix, call six zero two two six six two LDS. We had we had phone messages. We had two six six two LDS, two six six two JWS, and two six six two RCC. We had three phone lines with, oh yeah, and these were, uh, they were little brown machines. We've got pictures of us standing there in our little apartment um, with these little microphones plugged into these answering machines recording new messages, and man, the missionaries would call them, Jehovah's Witness, and you could call anonymously, of course, and just listen, and uh, yeah, we were doing that, that kind of stuff for years and years and years. Jesus is sufficient. Uh, we had this this one, a test for the Aaronic priest on the issue of the priesthood, because, man, Mormons claim to have the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood. I've almost never met a Mormon that had ever done any serious study of what the Bible actually teaches about the subject of priesthood. And you know why? Because I've almost never met a Christian who has ever done serious study about what 
the Bible teaches about the subject of priesthood. And I'm not talking about in regards to Roman Catholicism. That's a whole other issue to deal with. Um, but especially the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, the stuff that they claim foundationally. Um, this, is a, this is a great little track on, on, that, on that subject. And then this one that I'm going to try to get into today, I may not. This, this may be wisdom to do more than one program, <laughs> so we're not running too far over on time. Um, this one's t titled, Men is Not God. Now, I'll have to admit, I'll have to admit, Red, um, I can't read this. <laughs> I, I, I remember when we, first, when we first started going out to Mesa, I had this Bible that I could fit in my back pocket. And I'm going to tell you something. It, it, I don't, I'm not sure that I have reading glasses that would allow me to read the font in that thing now. But I could read that in the dark out there with those missionaries. That's how long ago this was. But is this, is this in PDF format on the website? It is. Okay. It is. Um, in fact, by the way, you mentioned the classes that we used to do. Yes. There's a video that we did at Calvary Chapel. Right. It's on our YouTube page. Okay. All right. The whole, the whole uh, law of eternal progression thing. Right. So, yeah, we did, we, I, I, made a, I did a presentation that was pretty much our training thing um, at Calvary Chapel. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, that was probably pre Potter's Freedom. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, that was done with a VHS recorder that I, I borrowed. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's on the YouTube channel. As is a presentation I did on the Eternal Law of Progression from, um, now I'm not sure if it's on our YouTube channel, but it should be linked there. But somewhere out there uh, in Alaska, I did the Eternal Law of Progression presentation. Um, that's up there too. So we do have a lot of stuff out there. I, I, you would think after all these years. Um, but men is not God. Men is, it's not man is not God. And a lot of people think that you said man is not God. No, men, M I N is not God. Men is not God. Uh, we need an old people's version of this, which would be about this big, um, uh, much well, larger. Uh, yeah. Cause this is, it's too small for me to read. Um, I'm, it was one of these two. You, maybe you'll remember which one it was. Rich and I are going to, someday, you're going to tune into this program. Rich and I are going to be sitting on a set um, with our grandchildren uh, running, <laughs> running, and Rich and I are going to be in rocking chairs going back and forth. Rich, do you remember? Because <laughs> we already do that around here anyways, just without the rocking chairs. Um, <laughs> 40 years, what do you want? One year, just one of these two tracks, one year at the end of the day, the priesthood line was wrapping around because at night they would have a priesthood meeting, which was only guys. So if you want to see a massive JC Penny convention, <laughs> uh, here, here it is. Um, just the guys, their white shirts, dark ties. And this line would form, and it would wrap around the outside of Temple Square. This was before they built the meeting house, the, uh, the Meganacle. Um, and honestly, I think one of the reasons they built the Meganacle was because of us. I really do. I think we were part of many, many reasons. Um, <clears throat> but we had learned human behavior. And so we, I forget who it was that came up with the idea. We started at the back of the line, because see, this is what happens. When people are standing in a line, or, they're, wa or they're, they're walking in in a line, if they see someone in front of them refuse a track, it increases the likelihood that they are going to refuse the track. So we came up with this idea. So we it took- to be, It had to be either you, Mike, or Teddy, because I was told how to do this when I got there. Okay, all right. So this is pretty early on. And we took the last of the tracks we had. I think it was this one. I think it was this one. I think it was the, the, the priesthood track. It was the priesthood. Okay. It was the priesthood. It was, the priesthood. It was what is your? Uh, no, I test with the Aaronic priest. 
No, it's well, we, we worked that one, yes. But remember, what is your authority, guys? I know, I but know. I'm I am next to certain that it was the Iran. It was it was this one. And so what we did is we took the last that we had, and we went to the back of the line. And so they're facing another direction. And so there's nobody in front of them that's that's refused this track. And they're going to be standing there for a long time. They're bored. They're bo this, was, this was one of our best. We wiped out our entire supply. We ran out. We, we wiped out our entire supply. And what I will never forget is this was so long ago that our vehicles were parked just across the street, up, up north uh, in, in the parking lot up there. So as we pulled away, I mean, we're exhausted. We've been there since the morning. We've been standing all day long. As we pulled away and we drove around Temple Square, here is this entire line of Mora missionaries. And they are all sitting there with this track. And they are reading this track. And they're talking about this track. I mean, talk about nailing it. Uh, it was, I'll never, ever, ever forget that. And you know, uh, I've told the story before, and we are going to continue this, okay? I've decided. We'll, we'll continue this. I've just been spending too much time telling you stories. Um, so we'll call this Witnessing to Mormons, part one. Um, but I, I, I'll never forget a um, number of years ago. You, you want the providence of God. You, you, this wasn't just something to where, you know, you do this and um, it makes us feel better and, uh, you know, you, you, you keep your support up because you went and talked to the Mormon. Um, not only did I run into, for example, Elder Hollywood in Salt Lake City, a missionary that I had an incredible encounter with in um, Mesa at the Easter pageant. I'm tired of looking that direction, so we're gonna, I'm going to look this direction. How, how's, how's that sound? I'm gonna change, the, change the camera direction. That was all set up to look at the big board. Yeah. We, we, do have, we do have all sorts of cool stuff on the big board uh, for next time. Uh, I even finally got wise enough to change the color scheme on the Old Testament section in accordance. So it'll actually be much easier for me to write on it and it'll look much better in the cameras and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll get to looking at monotheism and the, the best text to memorize. By the way, please, if you are interested in this, please go to aomin.org and search for 100 verse memorization system. 100 verse memorization system. Ah, see, there. There you go. And that, and that, then that looks so much better than it than it has in the past when we're looking at the Old Testament. It would get wiped, it would get washed out because we had a white background. Now I've I've gone to black background, so everything is nice and clear now. Anyway, go to aomin.org, look up 100 verse memorization system. Um, I remember writing this. In fact, I wrote this in that little teeny tiny office on 16th Street, um, on the compact. No, no, it was compact. It was it was the little green screen compact. I remember it. I remember the dot dot dot, dot commands in WordStar uh, to format all of it. Um, and it's still for a believing Mormon is still completely relevant. And uh, if you want to know what verses and the context in which to use them, uh, the hundred verse memorization system is still extremely useful along those lines. In fact, if you went and, and got that now, you'd be ahead of the game uh, next program when we, when we continue with this subject. Um, uh, and I think there's one for Jehovah's Witnesses, if I recall correctly. Anyway, uh, again, we're talking about stuff that was written 35 plus years ago. And you know, you're trying to convert it from dot matrix printouts to digital to get it on the blog and, and everything else. Anyway, um, I had, I ran this missionary. I'll, I'll tell you two stories. Two stories, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. And then you have to, 
Yeah, 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 I should, what I should. What is going crazy over? What is that? This? Yeah. Okay, all right. Don't let me forget. Um, two stories and we'll talk about the, what's called the quad. Um, this missionary that I ran into in Mesa, it's during the Easter pageant. Missionaries have their name badges. And his said, Elder Hollywood. He was arrogant, brash, probably about 6'3", something like that. He was, a big, he was a big boy. But you could tell he wasn't your normal Mormon missionary. He was, I don't even know how to describe him. But his name wasn't Hollywood. That just gave you an idea. He had had a, this made up because that's what people called him. He was loud and he was arrogant. Um, and he was proud of himself. Uh, foolish pride of life, let's put it that way. Well, he and I tangled. Not in the way that Rich tangled with people. <laughs> I still got to bring that up. Yes, yes, go for it, buddy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rich, has, Rich has mellowed over the years, uh, but we won't tell you about his charismatic background. Uh, anyway, um, and we tangled, and I, I would not back down to this guy. And we were at, a, you know, there, there used to be an Arby's at the corner of Main and Hobson. It's gone. Um, and uh, what? It's gone because of us. Well, uh, maybe. Maybe. Oh, it was because we did the Marty Minto thing there, remember? Mm. And they bought the, the land and tore the place down. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we may have, yeah, it's possible. Um, they were distributing my picture to the missionaries for years, so they wouldn't meet with me in people's homes. So you never know. Anyhow, uh, I remember I'm I'm facing toward I'm facing uh, west, and I'm hitting this guy with a lot of the texts that we'll be talking about. And when I say hitting, what I mean is presenting it in such a way you're not just quoting it. You're giving its background, you're giving its meaning, and hence the weight of those texts is self-evident to the Mormon person. And he's just, he's not used to this. He's getting angry. And, fi and there's a lot of people standing around listening. That was, that was the thing back then. Um, it's hard to get Mormons to talk to you now. It really, really is. But back then, you would get a group. I would have, I'd have 30, 40, 50 people standing around me. It would be thick, and they'd be listening. And uh, I'm not sure, were you, were you there when the, when the, when the cop, because this was early on, this may have been just before you started, but we had a, a Mesa PD sergeant come up to us the last night, Saturday night. I remember he had yellow glasses, and he comes walking right up to us. He says, who's in charge? We're like, uh-oh. <laughs> You know, uh, so well, well, I would be. Just, just want you to know, I've been uh, been watching you all all week long, and I just want you to know you've you've honored the Lord in the way you've you've done what you've done. He was a Christian. That was your son. Yeah, I mean that was one of the first, very very first. I I might have been twenty twenty one maybe somewhere around. There. Anyway, so. Uh, there's a lot of people listening. And Elder Hollywood finally, in a very loud voice, comes right up on me. I mean, he is looking down at me. I am looking up at him. And he says, Someday I'm going to be a God and you are going to worship me. That loud. And you, you, you look around at the, at the people, and the, the, the Christians are like, but the Mormons are like, you don't say that part out loud? <laughs> Not that loud! <laughs> you know? Just like, ah! Uh, and the, the, the Mormons are like, oh my goodness, the missionary lost it. Well, the next night he came up to me and he apologized. And we had a good conversation. I gave him contact information. I, 
I think I brought, I think I gave him books, um, maybe a Bible, I don't, I don't remember. Years later, it's been over a decade later, this guy comes walking up to me in, in Salt Lake City. So it's not Mason, now it's, it's the General Conference. I was at the South Gate. A lot of strange things have happened at that South Gate. Um, and he comes walking up to me and says, um, not sure if you remember me. And he starts smiling. And I go, Elder Hollywood. <laughs> he laughs. Ah, and we start talking. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a Mormon anymore. Now, he wasn't a Christian either. Um, what's happened to him since? I, I don't know. I made sure he could still contact us. But years later, at the North Gate, early on, um, you know, when we first started witnessing the Mormons, we didn't have to carry much with us because, like I said, the Mormons actually knew what they believed. But as the years went by, you had to start carrying more and more LDS documentation with you. This was before, you know, today, you can have the entire LDS library on your phone, you know, and so do they. Uh, journal discourses, whole nine yards. So I remember I, I bought this camera bag. And I would have teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith, Mormon doctrine, maybe articles of faith. Um, and I remember one uh, trip up there, I had a couple copies of Letters to a Mormon Elder. So this was after I started writing. And I don't know why, but I had a copy of God's Sovereign Grace. Now, a lot of people have never seen that book, but it was one of my first books on Reformed theology. And uh, I guess I don't know why I would have had that in my bag. That may have been a mistake. I, maybe I was going to give it to somebody else. I, I don't remember. And I had a conversation with a guy. I had given away all my copies of Letters to a Mormon Elder. Had a conversation with this guy. It was a good conversation. And at the end, I gave him a copy of God's Sovereign Grace. And that's not... It's not normally what you give to a Mormon, <laughs> a book on Calvinism, you know? But hey, it's got God's truth in it. It's got the gospel in it. And I didn't really think about it. It was 10 years later, at least 10 years later. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, I was at uh, Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church for 29 and a half years. And I would be willing to bet that they still have an actual cassette answering machine in the office. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, mm, yeah, okay. Um, by the way, Pastor Fry retired at the end of this. Uh, you know who the pastor is? Indeed. Uh, young man that... Uh, so that machine may have been replaced. It's possible. <laughs> it, it is possible that finally the machine has been replaced at, at Phoenix Forum Baptist Church. But it is fascinating that the pastor of the Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church came to Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church after he met me at the Arby's at the uh, Mesa Easter pageant. After he, I think because he heard us on the local radio station and came out, and that's how Warren and I, and, and yeah, so that's amazing God's providence over the years. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, everything's connected together. It's awesome. Anyway, we had, the, the pastor said, there's, there's a message for you on the answering machine. <laughs> okay. So I go in and, you know, yeah, believe me, if you've never had an answering machine, they're frustrating. You think voicemail's bad? Try putting it on a tape. Uh, it's, it's great. Anyways, here's this message from a woman in, if I recall correctly, Logan, Utah. Now, Logan is north of Salt Lake, up the freeway there. And she says, could anyone please help me? My husband went to General Conference years ago, and he talked with somebody at General Conference, and he brought a book home with him. It's a blue book called God's Sovereign Grace. 
And my husband never read it, but he put it on the shelf. I took it down, and I've read this book, and I believe what it says. But I can't find anybody else that believes what it says. Can you please help me? I don't know if there was a... The only guess I have, how would she have gotten... I just don't know how she would have gotten that number. Even from our tracks or anything, I don't, I don't even know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who is it dedicated? I think I may have dedicated that. I think I made, I think at the beginning, I made reference to Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church yeah. in the yeah. dedication. That's how, it, wow, wow. So she looked it up. And so here is a woman in Logan, Utah, that's read my book on Calvinism that I gave to someone at the at the general conference years earlier, going, is there anyone around here who believes this? So you know what I did? Um, this next April, uh, I think it's, the, it's April 3rd, um, is a celebration up in Salt Lake of... Jason, I'm sorry, is it 30 or 40 years? Because I, I think it's 30, maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years. I, okay, 30 years, at least 30 years. I could look it up on Facebook because uh, I've been invited to be there and I'm going to try to make sure to, to be there because, yeah. So, so uh, long, long ago, uh, we hooked up with Jason Wallace and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, now out in Magna. They were meeting in Salt Lake for a number of years. And Jason had a, Jason did a, like a public access television program, and Jason's done everything for decades to be a witness for the gospel in Salt Lake City. And he's a good Presbyterian, I'm a good Baptist, but we're Reformed, and he's the one that set up all those debates we did for years and years until the Mormons finally gave up and said, we can't do this anymore. Uh, he's done debates up there. Um, he is still, I just love getting these uh, on Facebook. Uh, he, he rents these vehicles yeah. because what we did, what we did is I got hold of Jason and said, um, Here's a lady way north of you that's read my book on Calvinism. He started going up there, starts planting a church, using that as the foundation. They're doing the same thing down in Cedar City right now. I had, the, I had I'm going to tell you, it was one of the most joyous experiences of my life last year. In April of 2021. One of the most joyous experiences of my life is I was on my way up to Utah, up to Salt Lake, and the church there in Magna is planning a church in Cedar City. Now, Cedar City, you got Salt Lake is one thing, but Southern Utah, Oh, man, that is Mormon town. I, that is, wow. So to try to plant a church in southern Utah. And so um, I met with the folks there, and we, we rented a room at the local university. And I did a presentation on the Trinity in southern Utah. We packed the room out. They were so encouraged. I got to talk to folks afterwards that have been so deeply influenced by this ministry. It was so awesome. And then as I'm leaving, after it's all over, I get in my truck and hear stuff coming over my phone because it's the first night of Apologia uh, passing out tracts at the Easter pageant. And here is a picture 
of my granddaughter Clementine standing on the street corner, holding tracks, witnessing to an LDS cop. And I was sitting here going, she's, I think she was nine, eight, nine at the time. And that's the same street corner where I used to witness to LDS cops when I was 20, only a matter of years older than her, but she's my granddaughter doing it now. And I just sat there in the truck, just, it's just incredible. Just, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Um, it was, it was, it was really super. So there you have, um, a book that wasn't about Mormonism end up being used years and years later. Um, you just never know. God can use anything, and He has used. And that book is available on Amazon, I believe. How do you get it? Sovereign Grace of God. Right, the Sovereign Grace of God. Right. But it is available on Amazon. Right. Yeah, it's it's still out there. Uh, so anyway, uh, we will we will continue with that. Now, people have been asking. You can see stuff over here. I'll just tell you now, my, my, my plan today was uh, to uh, run through some Bible verses uh, on, this, on the screen. Um, that's strange. I almost feel like there's heat on. Uh, hopefully there isn't. Um, well, it is warm outside. Uh, it's going to be 75 degrees here tomorrow. Anyway, we're gonna go th I was going to go through some key texts in Isaiah and Jeremiah on the subject of uh, the fact there's only one true God, which we, we will do. And then, given I had the track, men is not God, I was going to talk about some historical issues. And one of the clearest is the subject of the Joseph Smith papyri. So here, for example, is Robert Rittner's uh, signature books, the Joseph Smith Egyptian papyri, a complete edition. Um, okay. Um, and... Uh, John Gee's, two of John Gee's books uh, on the Book of Abraham. He's a Mormon. One of the best books from 1985, uh, Charles M. Larson's By His Own Hand Upon Papyrus. I don't know if this is even still in print. I'll be honest with you. Um, but, I mean, it is obviously very, very dated, but it also has the longest, I think this is one of the, you know, here's a fold out of the, of the papyri and, and stuff like that. I'll explain what its significance is and, and stuff like that. And then I have, uh, from the church's own website, the facsimile I was going to work through. But the question was asked, what is that massive book you have up there? And, of course, this is known as the Quad. And so it is the... So, so this is called the Triple. And so this is the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl Great Price. So these are the official LDS scriptures that are uniquely LDS. And then you put, it to get, put that together with ugh, the King James Version of the Bible and a Bible dictionary, and you end up with what's called the Quad, the King James Version of the Bible, Book of Mormon, Dr. Covenant's Pearl Great Price, uh, which I can assure you um, the binding on these breaks quite regularly. <laughs> uh, if you don't get the very best editions, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. And this isn't the very best edition. Uh, this one is actually, uh, I got this fairly recently. So yeah, this is the 2013 edition. Um, and so it's King James Version of the Bible, and then the Book of Mormon. Uh, there's a topical guide that's huge. Uh, and this is all at the back of the, the Bible. Bible photographs, and then finally... You, takes all the way to here until you get to the uh, Book of Mormon, Dr. Covenant's Pearl Great Price. Thumb indexed. What? Oh, well, okay. Uh, all right. What do you mean like, okay. All right. Yeah, there you go. All right. That's called the quad. And um, so that's all your, oh. Like I said, for years and years and years, what we would do is I would carry a, the micro edition of the triple. And it, again, it would fit in your back pocket. And so that would give you the Book of Mormon Doctrine and Covenants Pearl Great Price. And that obviously is where 
the vast majority of the doctrinal stuff, actually, it's the Doctrine and Covenants for Great Price, where you have the vast majority of the specific doctrinal material that you're going to be dealing with in regards to Mormonism. But yeah, that is, uh, that's the big beastie, and um, uh, you wouldn't want to carry that for a long night out in Mesa or all day in, uh, in Salt Lake. Uh, it would give you a pretty bad, pretty bad backache by the end of the, end of the, end of the day. Even if you had it in a in a in a bag, it would be be too much. So I should have I should have realized I wouldn't get through almost any of this, especially once I started telling you the stories, because there are just so many. Um, we we have you know we've seen uh, when I was in Cedar City, um, one of the one of the ladies that came up to me, um, and and I can't tell you how many times this has happened in various places. Um, People come up to me, and it was your debates, it was your books, it was your videos, it was Jeff Durbin's street witnessing material. Sometimes it's Jeff and I, because there's videos out there of Jeff and I doing stuff like that. Um, and of course, um, Jeff would tell you, uh, when did we first meet? Mesa, witnessing to the Mormons. Um, that was... That was where it started. That's where Apologia started. Um, and, and, and think about that for just a moment. Think about that. Let me just connect something here. I tweeted just a few minutes ago, before, what, a few minutes ago? A few minutes before the program started. Uh, I just saw, myself, a video featuring Jeff and Ken Ham. And uh, they are partnering with End Abortion Now. Because uh, end abortion now is putting uh, a bill in in Kentucky to abolish abortion in the state. And some of you may have seen uh, that uh, just last week, week before, early, early last week, um, there was a big meeting involving Josh Bice and G3. And many pastors in Georgia, including Georgia Right to Life, which is an amazing thing, with Jeff and Abortion Now, seeking to abolish abortion in the state of Georgia. Um, Jeff is, is burning the candle at both ends with End Abortion Now. That's why I'm, I preached last Sunday. I'll be preaching this Sunday. I'll, I'll, I, we're, we're participating in Biblical Sexuality Sunday, which is this Sunday. So I will be preaching on Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm going to be walking through that text, which, I'll be honest with you, a lot of Christians have just abandoned it as if it's not relevant to our current situation because they've been hit with arguments, especially bad out-of-context citations from Ezekiel. <laughs> um, if, if you're, you know, we meet at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so I'll probably start preaching about 4.45 our time. That would be 6.45 Eastern time. And so if you're not in church, something like that, I encourage you, grab, grab, grab a notebook in your Bible because I'm going to be walking through what is actually said in Genesis 18 and 19 and Genesis 13, which is where you got to start, and then the objections that people have used and many people have improperly accepted um, this coming Sunday. But the point is, uh, I get the opportunity when I'm in town to help by preaching and teaching at Apology of Church uh, while Jeff is doing everything he possibly can to encourage the end of abortion. And I remember when they started doing that. I remember when Apologia started doing that. Years and years ago. And where did Apologia come from? From, you know, meeting me out at the pageant and witnessing the Mormons. And, and who could have seen that? I, I, that was never something that I was trying to do. Um, but God saw it. And there are literally thousands of young children alive today. Uh, because of what's, I mean, I think, I think last I heard, over 900 churches involved with an abortion now around the world. 
and standing outside abortion mills and the, the pictures of the number of babies that have survived the womb. Um, that wasn't something I was looking to do <laughs> uh, 40 years ago when Alpha Omega Ministries was founded, but the Lord uses all sorts of things. It is truly, truly um, a blessing uh, to see uh, what, he, what he does. So we will, uh, we will try next time to jump right into the biblical texts that you would want to share with a believing Mormon, uh, specifically on the fact there is only one true God. And uh, then we will get into the facsimiles and uh, the book of Abraham. And uh, I will have to tell you the story about pulling into the parking lot of the Provo Temple um, in a badly running 1964 Dodge Dart. Maybe I'll even have time. Wow, I just about knocked my computer off the stand for the first time. Maybe I'll even have time to pull up a picture of the, uh, of the Dart before it was printed at Earl Scheib, all white, when it had numerous different colored panels on it, uh, that we drove through the night uh, up to uh, Provo and running into a poor missionary. I wonder, I don't know what this guy's name, but I really wonder what happened to him. Uh, and, and we landed on top of him, and he didn't even know what the Book of Abraham was. And he said, go down to that low building down there and ask for President Bishop. That little building was the Missionary Training Center, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> yeah, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the story uh, next, next time around. But um, anyway, so hopefully, I imagine you, you, you may get a, a few complaints. Uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to get to the heart of the matter, you know. But I think most people are, are, are actually enjoy uh, getting some of the history and and stuff like that, and, and maybe it'll give you some encouragement uh, along the way. So, um, all right, with that, thank you for watching the program today. We will see you next time. God bless.